Welcome back to Panda Cooking with Ja. So this is episode two. We're mainly talking about um, sustainable, ethical omnivore habits. So if you've ever read The Omnivore's Dilemma, um, the main issue is, besides the animal suffering, is the, the high eco footprint of meat. How like every pound of beef or whatever takes like acres and acres of farmland to produce because of the, the way that the, um, the, uh, the food chain works. Yes. On top of the amount of water that it uses yeah. as well. Exactly, Drea. Uh, so this is why we're preparing ethically sourced meat today. Um, um, like earlier this winter, I harvested um, a four point buck that bled out on the side of the road and immediately froze. Um, and I had read this article about how uh, roadkill is the most ethical meat because it's just a byproduct of our industrial highway system. The animals are killed very quickly, almost instantaneously. Um, and I found out that if you contact the Pennsylvania um, warden, animal warden, they'll give you a free deer processing license that usually costs hundreds of dollars if you're willing to pick up and deliver the deer yourself. So I got one of those for free, took the deer to a deer processor to get this nice venison, which has been frozen in my freezer for the last half a year. I think it keeps for up to a, to a year or so. And when we first got it, we made all sorts of things. But you know, even a half year afterwards, we can enjoy this lovely meat um, in a very ethical, sustainable way that allows us to get protein, but in a way that causes actually no footprint. Um, to our local ecosystem. If anything, it reduces the footprint because the state of Pennsylvania doesn't have to send out a roadkill van to pick up that dead deer. I picked it up myself. Um, so I'll let you know, okay, what you're looking for in quality venison is you want like a nice dark deep red. It's, um, it has much more iron than traditional meats. Um, I'm using two knives, like a slightly larger one to kind of like get the, um, the initial like deep cuts into it. Kind of go like get get it like this, um, and then a smaller paring knife because it's just tougher, kind of ligament wise. So you kind of want to chunk it up into little cubes. The recipe we're using today is a crock pot recipe. So the downside with uh, more gamey meats is they're a little bit more tougher, but they're also more flavorful. So you benefit from that. Um, but I like using a combination of the knives, including the paring knife, because you know it allows you to get just um, better, more nimble cuts, as you can see there. Um, and I don't even get into that whole debate about w whether to cut with or against the grain, as long as you can kind of cube it. It's very reminiscent of our first episode, um, doing poke, which actually means to cut in a Hawaiian, where we cubed up, uh, some tuna. This time we're cubing up some, uh, locally, sustainably sourced medicine. Um, you'll notice... Uh, oftentimes when we talk about meat, we like to use a, a different word instead of saying deer or pig or we use uh, pork and venison to kind of distance ourselves from the actual process of cooking and the meat. Um, I don't like that. I think people should kind of know where their food comes from. Um, I heard Mark Zuckerberg, um, he uh, almost gave up meat one year, but what he did instead was he followed the advice in the book Omnivore's Dilemma which I've also done for certain years, where you're allowed to eat meat, but only meat you either butcher or slaughter or hunt and kill yourself. Um, because it makes you appreciate the meat more, the sacrifice the animal made so you could get some protein. And it just makes you more mindful about your eating. And you're definitely not going to waste any part of the animal if it's an animal that you raised or killed or butchered. Um, so yeah, we're just getting uh, the nice deep cuts in there. Um, and then after we get the deep cuts, we cube it. So um, I think it's fine to uh, cull and harvest deer, especially in the Northeast Pennsylvania area. Uh, there's just way too many deer. Um, I'm sure many of you probably have had a family member who's gotten into a car accident with a deer. My mom has. Uh, entire side of her car like about a decade ago got totaled uh, she almost died there's just way too many deer in pennsylvania because we don't have enough natural predators anymore we've kind of uh gotten rid of all the wolves and the other parts of the ecosystem that would keep deer in check so now the only thing left to keep them in check is the highway system so i'm sorry mr deer but 
It's either us or the car. It's either you or the cars. So. And you said this was a this was a buck, right? This was a four point buck. Um. Yeah, actually, I got an offer from a when I was a deer processor by a hunter for the head of my deer, and I was like, really, man? Like, you just could claim credit for like. <laughs> this uh, roadkill deer that you bought from an Asian dude that was just trying to process meat. So I didn't, I didn't sell the head. Instead, I tried to do a, what's called a European-style mounting, which is basically um, just the bones by burying the head in the earth to let the insects kind of pick away at the skull. But I didn't bury it deep enough, and like another animal dug it up and took it away. So lesson learned, bury, bury your deer heads deeper. You know, for <laughs> even with just a couple feet. So, um, yeah, these uh, little cubes will make it uh, much easier for us to eat. And also, as we, as it cooks in the crock pot, it will break down quicker. And you can see this is a sizable amount of meat. Uh, this is going to be more than enough for us. We'll most likely to give it to some family and friends. Um, yeah, the... In Pennsylvania, it's always a surplus of deer meat. I literally had a talk with a friend yesterday talking about how I still had so much deer meat in the fridge. And it's like, no, nah, I'm good. Like, my family's stocked up. Um, Drea, you you, uh, you grew up with venison, right? Uh, yeah. I um, grew up in middle of nowhere Pennsylvania called Sayre. And um, we would always have hunters come hang out on our land and, you know, hunt deer. And the sort of the, uh, the trade-off there was that we would always get some deer meat. And, um, yeah, so I've, I've pretty much like grown up on deer meat. What's uh, your favorite part of the deer? The tenderloin. Oh, cool. Yeah. Have you ever had deer heart? I actually don't think I have. I served deer heart once and, uh, people didn't even know it was deer heart. They just thought it was some very flavorful beef. Did they love it or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I think a lot of people are just afraid of the concept of heart meat. Yeah. Uh, or venison in general. Okay. So this next step we're moving on to is uh, Andrea's chopped up these lovely veggies. Uh, so what do you, I see some onions, some carrots, some celery. What else is in there, Drea? Yeah, like lots of different colored uh, carrots and yeah, pretty much that plus uh, ginger and garlic. Okay. So um, we're going to put in this crock pot. It's going to cook for about eight hours. Um, and... Uh, I mean, what do you think, Dre? Should we put some broth in there? Should we use some of this blood broth? Or... I really don't think no, we should use that out. at all. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just gonna maybe just put a little bit of a little bit of water then, right? Yeah, water's good. Yeah. So... And then plus the the barbecue sauce yeah, yeah. that we're gonna so make. Now, instead of just using some boring A1, we're gonna make our own special Dre and Jaws organic, local war, sustainable roadkill barbecue sauce. Austin infusion. Yeah. So I'm just gonna, as this kind of cooks down, I mean, you could use stock too, but like our meat is so gamey that's just gonna add a ton of flavor. So, sign so make barbecue sauce from scratch. You get some kind of ketchup. Um, you can use generic, but we're gonna use Heinz because we're right across from the Heinz <laughs> loft. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, can I see that? Point your camera out there. See that giant Heinz, Heinz sign? Yeah. Whoop, there it is. Yeah, historical Pittsburgh. Um, okay, so we're going to squeeze a healthy amount. Um, Don't show them the other ketchup that's sitting on the counter. Oh, yeah, that's scandalous ketchup. <laughs> um, Drew, do you know the portions we're supposed to use for this? Uh, no, do you want to just wing it? Yeah, let's just wing it. I think we can make something good. Okay. Just go with your feels, man. Okay, I'm feeling that much so far. Um, that's that much. Which is, I would say, maybe a quarter cup. If you had to, like, use measurements. I like it a little uh, smoky, so for the, the, the spiciness, the kick, I'm going to use a bit of Tabasco. Um, and like, a, How spicy do you like it? I like things pretty spicy. Yeah, also because of the gaminess of the meat, it's tough to over-spice it. Yep. So I'm actually going to like put in a super generous portion. That's probably of, a good amount. That's fine. Chipotle. Point. I'm actually just going to finish off the bottle. You're going to finish? All right. You do you, man. Okay. Um, and that was already diluted. That wasn't pure Tabasco. That was, um, it was already diluted a little bit. Okay. Then good old Worcestershire. I love it. Like, that's why I buy the, the most giant-ass bottle of Worcestershire possible. <laughs> Worcestershire has a lot of complex ingredients in it. So in addition to, like, vinegar, it has molasses, sugar, onions, anchovies, 
Salt, garlic, tamarind extract, flavorings, chili peppers. So this will just... The tamarind's sub- my favorite part. This will substitute for almost, like, a dozen ingredients we could have added. Um, so there we go. Um, so we're also going to use some honey to kind of sweeten up and bind it together. I'm actually using honey from my friend Erica May's farm. She's a Pittsburgh singer-songwriter that now lives a farm in West Virginia called Heathberry Farms. They make their own honey. This is raw honey from there. There's their information if you want to order more of this honey. Um, you can tell it's real raw honey because it doesn't always stay super liquid. Kind of got to nudge it out a bit. Um, probably going to have to use a knife to... Uh, butter knife will force it out. Because uh, that's what real honey's like, folks. Uh, the Ugh, Unlike the... Uh... Yeah. Industrial honey, they add, um, uh, like a... What's it called? Like an emulsifier or a non-biting agent to make it always liquid. But real honey kind of clumps and sticks together, so... I've also read that they... When they take the honey from the bees, they also give them high fructose corn syrup to eat instead. What? Yeah, doesn't that feel bad? That's weird. Yeah, it feels awful. Um, anyway, so use about maybe two tablespoons of honey. I mean, anyone, any honey will do. We're just trying to be really local, born, and sustainable today. But, you know, if your honey comes out of a, like a bear-shaped thing, I won't judge you. It'll just be our little secret. I might, though. Oh, Drea's super judgy, but I won't judge you. Josh, your friend, and that's why you should come back for episode of three of Panda Cooking with Ja. The less judgmental version. Mm-hmm. But this is delicious. Drea, try some of this. Delicious. That's good. Right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Ooh, kind of crunchy. Yeah. Real raw honey gets a little crystalline. Okay. So I'm mixing this together. This with the, the knife I just used, and just let me scrape more honey into this. Um, oh, we probably want to add some apple cider vinegar, right? Yeah, but uh, let me get the consistency, and then we'll use the apple cider vinegar to uh, get the exact amount of liquidness we want. So already it's looking like barbecue sauce. Mm-hmm. Okay. I hope that's enough for the amount of meat we've got. I mean, we can always add more. Yeah. Um, I want to see what it tastes like. Yeah. That's very good. Okay, let's let's splash a little apple cider vinegar in there just to get a little bit more volume so we can fill up the entire crock pot over our meats. So, okay. Okay, and this vinegar will actually help break down the meat, too. Mm-hmm. And it will actually reduce. So it's okay to have a kind of liquidy barbecue sauce. What we had before was the kind of barbecue sauce you would put on, you know, like ribs or a burger. But you want a more liquidy one to cook down as you're using the crock pot. So you kind of want, like, this liquidy consistency. Okay, so we're basically done. All we're doing right now is uh, the crock pot is on high. We're going to leave it for eight hours. Now I'm going to take all this meat, and let's just do it here to, like, make lots of a mess. And I'm just I'm just dropping it in here. Just drop it in. And then I'm going to massage all the stuff in together. But, um, yeah, look at all those delicious chunks of venison. <laughs> um... Make sure you do it on a counter that you can easily clean or like it's going to look like a CSI scene. You might also want to not use a uh, wooden cutting board either. Yeah, you, yeah wood, will, the, the blood will seep in and you definitely not do not want to mix contaminants. Um, okay, so put this back in here. Okay, I'm going to wash my hands a little bit. Yeah, that barbecue sauce is real good. Yeah, okay, I'll still use this. Okay, and then I'm just pouring the barbecue sauce right over it. Um, Got those nice honey chunks. Yeah, and then I'm just mixing it up to get everything coated. Um, Mix it up with the, the veggies down below. 
I'm actually going to use additional apple cider vinegar just to wash out the remainder because we can still use a little bit more liquid in this. So, best way to clean everything is just to use residual amounts of liquid. stuff just to get the final make sure everything's evenly distributed oh that sound <laughs> yeah yeah that way you get like the veggies like interspersed rather than all sitting at the bottom and the main thing is you just want to make sure the level of liquid is above all your ingredients otherwise there's a chance that the stuff at the top will dry out so after I get everything kind of like all stirred up and mixed. Okay. And then I'm gonna push it back down so the liquid rises to the top. And you'll see, look, see? Now there's a nice layer of liquid covering everything. And then all we have to do is put our way our dishes and stuff. Minimal cleanup because we did it super. This is the Appalachian cooking, guys. You just like use one pot, one container for everything. And uh, all we do is we just cover up the crock pot um, and then return in eight hours or so and it'll all be good. Spend the rest of the day just, you know, drinking beers and kicking it old school, Pittsburgh style. Or just drinking tea. Yeah, we're drinking tea. Okay, so thank you for joining us for episode two of Panda Cooking with Ja with special guest Drea from Austin. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So remember, guys, eat locally and sustainably. Think about how you source your meat, even if you're a vegan or an omnivore or a carnivore or whatever your choice of nourishment is. You know, you can't just eat shoots and leaves like a panda. So come back for episode three. And keep supporting the show. Comment, share, like, post ideas and suggestions. And remember, everyone who does that always gets us into a drawing for some of our extra food because we always make way too much for ourselves. See you next week, guys. Bye-bye.